And starting us off is rock star Peter Todd. Let's give it up, Peter. All right, do we have slides here? Peter Todd, there you go. There you go. Cool. So I'm going to go talk about uh, the scale-related security issues. Um, oh, there you go. And why is that doing that? Ah, whatever. Back. OK, much better. So yeah, so scale-related security issues. Um, you'll notice I said scale, not scalability. Because we're not really talking about scalability here, we're just talking about I go change the number, what are the implications, and what kind of attacks can be made easier or harder by changing that block size number. And you know, I kind of want to go start out with really like what are we trying to actually accomplish? You know, what is the system meant to be? And uh, I kind of thought about it a bit, and of course, nobody really agrees on what it's meant to be. But what's interesting about it is as much as we disagree about what's meant to be. You know, there really are some sort of key things which all the different visions of what Bitcoin could be do go um, share. You know, and chief among them is validation. So you can go ask the question, well, what are we trying to prevent? Well, we're trying to prevent an invalid transaction. I'm trying to prevent getting money that doesn't actually exist. You know, so in this case, I mean, suppose I'm someone with transaction, TX1. And from an SPV wallet's point of view, this is kind of the, the data I see. You know, all I know is that I can link it to some blockchain, it's in there, but what I don't know is, is that transaction valid? You know, I'm, I'm currently in this state still trusting someone. And in Bitcoin, we have the ability of determining if things are valid by just going back in history and validating each step. You know? Here, transaction zero was spent in transaction one, and so on. And I can go back and go through all these different cases. And that does not work. There. Obviously, if something's gone wrong, we have an invalid uh, transaction. We'll notice this if we do this validation, go back in history. Similarly, the transaction might not exist at some point. And then finally, money might be spent twice. You know, that pretty much covers, funny enough, all these different use cases that all these different people want in terms of, you know, are the rules being followed? And when you talk about attacks, I mean, one of the issues I kind of had with this talk was I was thinking, all right, what are the attacks possible? And actually, it's pretty boring. It's someone puts invalid data. I want to know if that data in the blockchain is invalid. Because if I don't, well, the system just plain doesn't work. And the whole attack and the whole scale related thing as well. How much data do I need to determine if someone's doing something invalid? And right there, I mean, if I'm going to go through transaction history, you know, immediately, in the case of Bitcoin, due to a lot of uh, optimization issues, do a lot of things that you know could potentially be done but haven't. Long story short, is I need the whole transaction history. You know, can we go and improve on that? Well, in some ways, yes. And I'll give a quick example. I like to uh, use Where's Waldo here, where uh, imagine if the problem of finding that two transactions spent the same money was kind of akin to uh, playing Where's Waldo. You know, and we want to go find, did two Waldos exist? And it's very easy to go prove this. You know, we showed everyone else, hey, you have uh, two Waldos in uh, one place. Here is where they are. You know, going back to... Uh, my previous slide, again, TX1A exists, TX1B exists, they spend the same money. And that's our proof, very easy. You don't need very much data to show this. And in a system where information is easy to propagate and tough to censor, I can go and just spread this proof to the rest of the world. And it becomes a very easy question of, all right, is the blockchain invalid? Hey, someone found an in invalid part of it. Tax thwarted, done. Of course, from the miner's perspective, again, one of these issues of how does Bitcoin actually work right now, it's a lot of effort to go through and find that 
invalid Waldo in the first place, the, the double spend, and it's not, you know, there's a lot of techniques in the future to go consider, but from the point of view of right now scaling, this is our, uh, this is one of our big issues. You know, how do we manage this problem that currently we have this O n squared validation and anyone who wants to be a miner and actually has create valid blocks has to do all this work and have access to all this data. Another big uh, scaling related thing. Let's go look at what does it take for someone external to the system to attack it? And what this here is very convenient example for me, which is uh, Bitcoin XT blocks. You know, which blocks have been produced in the blockchain that um, advertise that they supported VIP 101. And you'll notice how it kind of goes up and then goes down again. That's because of an external attack. Someone went off and DDoSed a bunch of mining pools. Well, actually, I think mainly slush is really it. And they essentially threatened them saying, you know, if you continue supporting VIP 101, we're going to keep DDoSing you till you give up. And rally is they gave up. You know, and what does that have to do with scale? Well, again, if you're in an environment where the way we um, participate in Bitcoin is through relatively centralized uh, targets like slush mining pool, it's fairly easy to go pick and choose these targets and attack them till they give up. You know, and to the extent that uh, the question of scale changes what these trade-offs are, that's another scale-related security concern. You know, and personally, I think that the fact that we have this issue at one megabyte is uh, definitely cause for concern. We should think very carefully about this. And now when I went and talked about, you know, what do we want out of Bitcoin? Well, I think this is sort of where the talk starts to get a little more interesting and potentially a little more controversial. Because then you start to ask, well, what do we actually want from Bitcoin? And it's not clear to me that this is uh, something we have good answers for, but, you know, in a centralized or distributed system, the main thing that's in common with most systems we deal with is that there are single points of failure. Um, Paige Peterson, who's in the audience somewhere here, made this uh, nice diagram showing how in a centralized system or a distributed system, ultimately you have these points of control, and you can target these points of control by pursuing them legally, technically, or so on. You know, and currently in Bitcoin, um, we kind of look a little like this. You know, we haven't done a great job on minor centralization. So if your goal is to go and uh, decrease the number of single points of failure, that's really what you should be talking about as a security concern. And what's interesting there is that now we have this issue where in Bitcoin, anything that can lead to monopoly, anything that can lead to incentives to further centralize, that can be seen as a security consideration. That's something that causes issues with the inherent goal of uh, the system. So here's uh, probably the biggest topic in this. You know, do large miners have an advantage over small miners? And here I'll uh, go show uh, China versus the US in sort of a simplified model and talk a little bit about you know, how this kind of comes into play. Now, the question is, all right, who's going to find the next block? You know, China has a little more hashing power than the US, so chances are block number three is going to be found by China. Now imagine it is. Well, we have an issue, the Great Firewall of China. And what's interesting is for a brief amount of time, depending on the block size and how long it takes for data to propagate around the network, or, you know, at this moment, the US mining pools don't know that block three exists. From their point of view, block two is the most recent valid uh, block. So they're still working on block two, trying to go extend the chain. And they might go find a block extending the chain. But when they go find that block extending the chain, again, Great, Fall, uh, Great Firewall of China exists. Now we have this fork, and how is that fork going to get resolved? Well, what's the probability of who finding what block, considering what they know? China still doesn't know about block 3B. And even if they did, the way the incentives work is you might as well mine on the block you went and found first, because that's one that's most likely to propagate to the widest number. And then they go find block 4. 
Maybe at this point the US knows about this, maybe they don't. The point is, by the time it resolves, that's your most probable outcome. That block 3A was incorporated in the blockchain, block 4 was built on top of it, block 3B wasn't. So I went through all that. Now let's go ask ourselves what really happened here. Well, in terms of monopoly, what we really said is that the US had a disadvantage there where they went and did a lot of work and they didn't get rewarded for it. And in a nutshell, I think that's probably one of your more interesting uh, questions on scalability. You know, do we have a system where there are incentives for people to get bigger? And for the larger pools, once they're bigger, what kind of profitability do, do they then have? And I can go talk a bit about this where, you know, let's go look at what research is being done. Um, first of all, we have the sort of pre-selfish mining paperwork. Uh, we have people who've gone shown with some math that, you know, depending on how you set, depending on how you go, um, uh, assume blocks are propagated. You know, if I find a block and I get it's 50% of the hashing power, right there, who's gonna find the next block? Chances are it's, I'm gonna find the block and the other 49% are less likely to find that block. So when you go talk about this, what this means is once I'm at that threshold, now I have the advantage. Um, bit more work followed up and we were able to kind of say, all right, depending on uh, depending on you know, how you propagate information around, this threshold's about 30%. That was again uh, shown in the selfish mining paper in different ways. And on top of that now, we've done uh, various simulation results. Um, big one that works out really well is Peter Wool's work, where we've gone and shown that, you know, and he actually used um, realistic uh, you know, realistic uh, mining and latency numbers with this, where when you look at the situation in China, for the amount of time it takes data to propagate over the Great Firewall of China and their kind of relative hashing power percentage, people who are not part of that group are earning something like about 8% uh, less revenue. In reality, that doesn't really happen that way because, of, for instance, Matt Corallo's block relay network, um, you have a lot of miners who aren't actually validating. They just mine based on the assumption the previous block was valid. So we've kind of pushed that number down. But, you know, we've got to talk about the worst case in uh, security. And in the worst case, we're in a situation where, you know, under these kind of assumptions, there's a fairly significant uh, revenue um, difference between large miners and small miners. And ultimately, you know, I think this being an overview, I'll kind of say, well, you know, let's go look at that. Let's go and say where we can go and uh, go from there. Let's do our assumptions based on that kind of worst case. So I was actually uh, kind of planning on leaving a bit of time for questions. So uh, this bit shorter than I was expecting, but I'm happy to stop here. So thank, thank you, Peter Todd. Thank you, thank you. Okay, our next uh, presenter is not here, so we have a special. Ranjit will be presenting via audio. Uh, Jeremy will rock the slides. And this is going to be our last presentation in the security uh, and privacy segment. After that, we're gonna jump into testing, simulation, and modeling. Mmm, delicious, yes. All right, with that, I'll let Jeremy take over. Guys, uh, please give it up for Ranjit. He's going to be presenting soon. Presenting via audio. All right. Contracts. We'll be looking at uh, how much expressivity we can support and what limitations we might encounter. Then we look at efficiency issues and also see what kind of privacy guarantees we can make. Then I'll talk about some potential relaxations uh, which will help in uh, removing the fundamental limitations in uh, expressive power and also make smart contracts more usable. The main highlight of this talk will be the use of off-chain crypto for scaling purposes 
the magic technology that we'll employ will be secure computation, uh, which is an active area of research and is currently being pushed into practice. I will also highlight some academic research that, that backs integration of secure computation and Bitcoin. This integration provides protocols for smart contracts that shed new perspectives on scaling issues. Uh, overall, the goal is to encourage more effort in understanding the potential and to take a serious look uh, and with the hope that the ideas presented in this talk uh, will be worth considering and will make an impact. So let me begin uh, by taking a very abstract view of uh, contracts. Uh, these are basically a well-defined set of rules among a group of agents. Uh, the agents themselves join the contract only if they think that the rules are fair. And uh, that's it. Uh, supposed in this way, we can see that most things in everyday life and society are just contracts. Uh, more philosophically speaking, Bitcoin itself is, uh, is a contract between uh, among miners and users of the system. So um, there's no value in a contract unless the rules of the contract are enforced. And this is typically done by some kind of authority. Also, typically contracts involve data or money. Uh, for this talk, uh, we'll consider smart contracts as, uh, as contracts whose rules are enforced automatically via consensus, and we don't need to rely on any kind of authority. Um, we will use uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum as running examples to see different properties of uh, smart contracts. Uh, first, we look at the expressive power of smart contracts. Uh, in Bitcoin, the expressive co power comes from allowing transactions to be redeemed via scripts. Uh, the scripts are not restricted to specify just the recipient, but can also release payments based on uh, certain other conditions. Uh, but something that I want to point out is that uh, some of the opcodes in Bitcoin are restricted. Uh, these are done to avoid DOS attacks, and this limits uh, the expressive power. Uh, scripts give Ethereum its expressive power too, and uh, but Ethereum takes it one step further and uh, makes them Turing complete. Uh, now, one would imagine that uh, this sort of power is sufficient to cover all sorts of contracts, uh, but later in this talk, we'll be looking at some uh, simple contracts, uh, but still, these cannot be uh, enforced easily in either Bitcoin or Ethereum. Next, we look at uh, efficiency aspects of smart contracts. Uh, the script verification basically is what enforces the contract. It's very fast in Bitcoin because of the restrictions. There are very few opcodes, and these opcodes are, can, can all be efficiently evaluated. Uh, but looking ahead, and very generally speaking, limits on the block size also do not support scaling with respect to the uh, number of agents that participate in the contract or with respect to the complexity of the contracts. Uh, even, even in the two-party setting, the complexity of the contracts is kind of related to the block size limit. On the other hand, in Ethereum, the scripts are too powerful and ensuring consensus is a potential problem because miners might just lose the incentive to verify individual transactions uh, that could potentially contain very complex scripts and may take a long time to run. So later in this talk, uh, we will look at other interesting efficiency metrics for contracts. So privacy in general is not the main goal for Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, the focus is instead, and rightly so, on enforcing just the consensus. Uh, later in this talk, we will look at how to use off-chain crypto for enforcing privacy and also to get many more features. Uh, thus supporting the fact that privacy need not be natively supported with Bitcoin. It is okay. We will use off-chain crypto for taking care of that. So although uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum do support some version of smart contracts, uh, there seem to be some fundamental limitations of what contracts can be supported. Uh, for example, consider the basic contract that allows fair exchange, so two parties won't exchange their digital assets. Uh, the main problem in enforcing this is, of course, when one party tries to cheat and not send his asset, thus getting both assets. Uh, so how do we go about overcoming this attack and enforcing fair exchange? Uh, what we know is that if the assets are cryptocurrencies, then it's possible to implement fair exchange. Uh, this is via the protocol of Tiranol and from the Bitcoin forums. Uh, we can generalize the Tiranol protocol to get fair exchange uh, on assets as long as the assets have some supporting blockchains. 
But when the assets are arbitrary digital items and don't have supporting blockchains, then we have no idea how to implement fair exchange smart contracts. Actually, we have evidence that it might be impossible to achieve uh, this uh, in some strong models that may or may not apply to the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, in any case, uh, these are useful contracts and simple contracts. I mean, fair exchange is uh, as simple as contracts can get. So the question is uh, whether there is a way out. So suppose we change the file exchange contract like this, okay? So if the exchange happens, then everything is well. But if the exchange fails, then we impose a penalty on the cheating party that aborted the exchange. So let's call this variant of smart contract of file exchange, but with penalties, okay? It turns out that this relaxation is actually sufficient. For simple cases, and in the two-party setting, we can actually implement file exchange penalties using scripts that are currently supported in Bitcoin. We can also solve the problem in the general multi-party or the multi-agent setting, where the script size starts to grow linearly with the number of parties and becomes a scaling issue when the number of parties is large. In any case, the high-level point of the last two slides uh, is that there are some very basic contracts which are either hard or impossible to implement on Bitcoin, uh, or for that matter, even Ethereum. But if we introduce a relaxation, then we can start exploring the solution space and address scaling issues. So the general idea of the relaxation is basically to add an explicit penalty rule in the contract. That is, we include in the contract that if someone cheats, then the cheating agent is going to pay a penalty to all other agents. So this relaxation is actually very natural for contracts. All contracts are, are actually implicitly associated with a penalty for breaking the contract. Sometimes these are explicitly spelled out, sometimes they are resolved in a code of law. But in our setting, we will explicitly specify the penalty as monetary value that will be extracted from the cheating party if it deviates from the action specified in the smart contract. Such a relaxation uh, could be the right one, since recent academic research actually backs such smart contracts and shows, to shows how to implement these contracts on Bitcoin-like systems, of course, some extended support. Uh, So to get a feel of the relaxation uh, applied to smart contracts, let's look at an example app, which is a smart contract to implement poker in a decentralized setting. So here the agents in the contract obviously correspond to poker players. The rules of the contract correspond to poker rules. And the action steps of the agents involve either data or transactions. The data will be the cards that they possess and the community cards, which might be secret. And the action steps uh, specify, also specify the transactions, namely the bets that the agents place as the game proceeds. Now, uh, in a decentralized implementation that is resistant to collusions, we have to recover from an abort by a player. Okay? A player may abort at any stage when it finds that it's unlikely to win the game. Uh, now, the relaxation with penalties only specifies that we extract a penalty from a cheating player and distribute it among the players that follow the action steps. Uh, so that, that, that alone is sufficient, and this will be our code. So now that we have set our eyes on implementing the relaxed variant of smart contracts, uh, let's look at some scaling issues in implementing smart contracts. Right? The obvious parameters are the number of agents, uh, the size of the rules, the size of data. Now I'll also include privacy as a scaling parameter, since uh, privacy is important, to enforce, uh, it's important to enforce in, smart, in, in sensitive contracts, and we want to take into consideration the overhead due to privacy. Just the first three parameters are directly related, affected by the limit on block size, and we'll see the type of solutions that we can come up with to say something meaningful and non-trivial about scaling issues. So our solution ideas, uh, which I'll be presenting in the next couple of slides, uh, will have two main themes. The first is that we'll be trying to build complex multi-agent contracts with large number of rules and handling serious data, but from very simple contracts. Okay, in the next slide, we'll say exactly what I mean by simple contracts. Uh, the second main theme is to use off-chain crypto technology to support scaling issues. Namely, we remove, try to try and remove the on-chain dependence on size of rules and the size of data. So, here is a simple contract uh, that involves only two parties. Uh, we call it the claim or refund uh, transaction. 
It's basically a rehash of uh, the zero knowledge contingent payment uh, described in the Bitcoin wiki uh, in 2011. Uh, in the claim or refund uh, transaction or contract, uh, we have a designated sender and a designated receiver. The sender locks coins in the transaction and specifies some criteria. Uh, now the receiver can lock these coins and claim it if it produces some data that satisfies the criteria. The receiver has to do this within time t, otherwise uh, the sender coins are just refunded back to the sender. So that's it. This is the description of the claim or refund transaction. So the way I've described uh, the claim or refund transaction, I don't make any explicit references to the blockchain. So this abstraction can be useful um, to apply as well in other contexts where there's no blockchain supporting the currency. Um, anyway, the super cool thing about uh, claim or refund transactions is that quite surprisingly, you can build complex contracts out of them. Uh, as an example, in case study, uh, we'll actually look at the problem of multi-party fair exchange with penalties and uh, see how we can build uh, this from just basic claim or refund transactions. So the idea behind this slide is, uh, is basically only to give a taste of the contract design. The contract I present uh, here on the right is actually resilient to collusions of up to n-1 out of n parties. Uh, I would recall that we allow to enforce penalties if, if a party aborts the exchange in the middle. Uh, and we still have to make sure that parties that behave honestly do not get penalized. So we will use the add annotation to capture a claim or refund transaction. An add from P1 to P2 represents a claim or refund transaction with P1 as sender and P2 as receiver. Uh, P2 must provide data T that satisfies uh, the sender criteria within time tau. And uh, in, case, in this case, P2 will actually claim the transaction and will get like Q coins uh, that was originally deposited by the sender. So the protocol enforcing fast change with penalties contract is on the right. It's uh, effectively a sequence of claim or refund transactions. The ordering, the deposit amounts, and the data criteria are all set in a way such that the penalties are enforced in the right manner as desired. So my goal here is only to give a taste of how the transactions look, and uh, more importantly, uh, how a complex multi-party fast exchange contract can be broken down and enforced by a sequence of very simple two-party contracts. So I will not be going into the details of, uh, of the actual protocol, but uh, just I'll mention like a couple of drawbacks uh, that this protocol has. One is that there is no data privacy in this protocol. All the data, you know, to claim a transaction, you'll have to reveal the data that satisfies the criteria. It's, it's out there in the blockchain. Also, even though the transactions are two-party, the size uh, of these transactions will grow with n, the size of the transaction will also be as big as the data. All these are major drawbacks and will affect scaling. Uh, but the good news uh, is that all of these issues can be addressed just using crypto technology. So the crypto technology uh, that is going to help us out is secure computation. Um, this actually allows a set of disjoint parties to run computation on the joint data to obtain results, uh, but leave nothing else. And it is straightforward to achieve such a notion in an ideal world uh, where parties are willing to trust some kind of uh, authority. So there, they simply submit their data to the trusted party and get back results. The privacy and correctness are immediate in the ideal model, but of course, we place our trust in the third party. Uh, in the real world, however, there is no such party to trust. Uh, but the transformation from the ideal world to the real world is made possible by secure computation. That is, uh, parties can input their data to a secure computation protocol and end up with the results of the computation without leaking anything else, and they don't have to trust any party. So one thing that I want to mention is that uh, secure computation is currently an active area of research and cryptography, especially in the last decade. Uh, it has seen tremendous improvements uh, in efficiency. Another thing that I want to mention is that uh, crypto technologies that have gained a lot of recent attention, such as SNARKs, uh, non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs, fully homomorphic encryption, obfuscation, and others, these are all just special cases of secure computation. Uh, and, but they impose additional restrictions on interaction, and as a result, they are like much less efficient uh, than secure computation itself.
So using uh, the power of secular computation, we can obtain significant improvements over previous fire over the previous fire exchange uh, with Hanover's protocol, and also more generally for stateless contracts. Uh, we can actually support arbitrary number of agents without uh, fearing to go beyond the block size limit. Uh, we can also remove on-chain dependence on the size of rules and the size of data. Uh, all the computer, all the computations involving rules and data will be carried out off-chain via the secure computation protocol. Privacy, of course, will be guaranteed uh, by the secure by the crypto technology. Uh, so for stateless contracts, the, the combination basically works wonders, and you can implement fire exchange protocols on Bitcoin as it is today without any modifications. Uh, for stateful contracts, we can get uh, a non-trivial feasibility result. Uh, we can also guarantee privacy, but only in a stronger variant of Bitcoin that, that offers uh, extended support. So, for example, for the poker contract, we will need signature, signature verification on arbitrary but bounded data. We won't need like super powerful Turing complete scripts, so that's definitely an improvement over Ethereum. Uh, but we, we, we still need some extended script support. Uh, another caveat is that the protocol will need a large number of uh, two-body transactions, small size two-body transactions, but we need a large number of these. But I believe your off-chain payment channels uh, like Lightning um, you know, can be of uh, major help. So I do not have much time to present the details of the protocols and how to combine Bitcoin and secure computation. Uh, but here is a list of uh, academic work and major crypto slash security conferences on this line of research in the last uh, two years. And uh, I would encourage you to go uh, and take a look at them to get a flavor of uh, how the protocols are actually designed. So uh, summarizing, uh, we introduced a natural relaxation uh, called smart contracts with penalties. Uh, this was intended to remove limitations on the expressivity of smart contracts. Uh, the main highlight of this talk was uh, the use of off-chain crypto for scaling purposes and the magic technology that allowed us to do this was secure computation. Uh, this is currently an active area of research and is being pushed into practice. The combination of Bitcoin and secure computation is very powerful and in addition it also provides new, perspective on, new perspectives on scaling issues that might be uh, interesting to the Bitcoin community. Uh, overall, I believe that this approach uh, deserves more effort and attention from all sides and uh, this can lead to a newer, powerful and uh, more useful smart contracts uh, on top of Bitcoin, which in turn will enable Bitcoin itself to be a killer app in many scenarios. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ranjit. It was awesome. All right, uh, just a quick reminder, everyone, uh, our Twitter hashtag is ScalingBitcoin. Uh, if we want people to know about the awesome uh, presentations and insights we have here, please do share it. Uh, I hear folks are on IRC. Hi, IRC. So um, please uh, tell folks what we're doing. Um, again, uh, communicate it out. If you do not have Wi-Fi access, if you turn to your right um, corner, you will see the uh, information written up on a sheet. We ask you not to tell this to everybody uh, so that it's right there. So uh, there's the SSID login and pass. All right, next up is uh, Itai. And he's going to rock us out on testing, simulation, and modeling. And uh, also remember, uh, our rules of code and conduct are still enforced. Uh, please, no harassment. Um, let's be intelligent. You guys are doing a great job as is. So I just want to say thank you for adhering to the code of conduct. I will try to do a better job myself. Let us welcome Itay to present. Let's rock it. Thank you. Um, clicker. Thank you. Hi. Uh, we're talking today about how to scale Bitcoin. What do we want to do when we scale Bitcoin? We want lower latency, we want higher throughput, more bandwidth, more transactions per second, and we want security. Uh, how can we do that? We can try to tune the parameters. We'll, uh, in, in all the plots here, I'll have time going from left to right, and these are blocks in rectangles. 
So what can we do? We can have larger blocks and will give us uh, better throughput. Seemingly, we can have shorter block intervals and so we will get better latency. Transactions will come in quickly or faster onto the chain and we'll have better throughput. Um, but then uh, we get forks when we do that, right? Uh, we have mining power loss, I'll talk about that. We have unfairness. Smaller miners get less uh, revenue. This leads to uh, centralization, I'll talk about that. We have a longer time to converge because of these forks. You don't know where you are on the chain. I'll talk about that. But the point here is the following. We need proper evaluation. We needed a scientific way to realize what we're achieving and how to evaluate which proposal is better because we're seeing a lot of argument and we need a clear way uh, to uh, realize which way is best. Um, now what uh, 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 we do in this project I'm presenting you is uh, we run the actual code, uh, the, the source, Bitcoin client, compiled, that's it and we emulate the world for it. Uh, we emulate the network based on measurements from the actual Bitcoin network. And um, uh, we do some basic bootstrapping and then we just run the raw code. Uh, so that's fine, now we can, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I should talk about scale. We're, we have uh, 500 machines. The experiments I'll show you later are from a thousand Bitcoin nodes running on 150 machines uh, with multi-core. Um, so now we know how to run and how to evaluate, but what do we measure? So let's talk about measurements. The first measurement, and we'll introduce a couple of metrics here, a few metrics here. The first one is consensus delay. Okay, consensus delay is how, how long it takes you to reach agreement. The easiest way to explain this is by example. The 80%, 80% consensus delay is 10 seconds if for 80%, at least 80% of the time, at least 80% of the nodes agree on what happened until 10 minutes ago. So we want a shorter consensus delay and we agree uh, closer to now. And uh, these are the results. The first type of experiments we're doing are on latency. We want to reduce latency. We want transactions to come in faster. The bandwidth in all of these experiments is the same as Bitcoin's. So we reduce the interval between blocks and we also reduce block size so the, free, the bandwidth remains the same but the blocks come in much faster. And you see on the uh, X scale uh, the block frequency. So one means one block every second and 0.1 means one block every 10 seconds. Um, we're running this at a very low scale because then it's uh, very easy to see prominent results but uh, the trends are, are clear and they hold throughout. And so we see that as we increase the block frequency, the uh, consensus delay improves. Uh, the Y scale here is also exponential, uh, logarithmic, sorry. So we get improvement, uh, which is what we want. But as we increase block size, and this is the second type of, type of experiments I'll present, we have now a block every 10 seconds. Again, this is quite short. And we uh, increase the block sizes that are generated every 10 seconds. And here you see that as you increase block size, you get uh, the consensus delay way up and it grows quickly. This is bad. So we're trying to improve uh, bandwidth and uh, this is what happens to consensus delay. A uh, second metric is called time to prune. Uh, this is a subjective metric. So as a, as a participant in the system, I'm measuring the time it takes you to realize that you're sitting on a branch. So once you're sitting on a branch, how long it takes you to realize that the real chain is somewhere else? Uh, we obviously want this to be short. And again, we see an improvement here as we reduce uh, the block interval, as the, we increase, increase block generation frequency, we get a better, uh, better pruning time. And this will be uh, the last optimistic slide for a while, so enjoy it. <laughs> uh, block size, as we increase it, things go bad, we get a worse and worse time to prune very quickly. Uh, next, I'll talk about fairness, uh, and we measure fairness as follows. We know that larger miners get uh, more than, I, I'm not talking about any form of cheating, not selfish mining, nothing else. This is just blocks, uh, miners mining, but larger miners, I mean any miner mines on uh, their own branch if there is a fork. And so uh, larger miners get more. So I'm asking myself, how much do the miners that are not the largest get? Do they get their fair share? and we want this to be one. We want them to get exactly what they need. 
And we see that as, as we increase frequency, block frequency, again, bandwidth throughput is the same. We have faster blocks, smaller blocks. We get the fairness going down very quickly as we increase block frequency. Block size, same result. It's a bit noisier here, but uh, the trend is clear. Uh, mining power utilization. This is how we secure Bitcoin. Uh, I'm measuring here the ratio of blocks that end up in the main chain. Every block outside the main chain is a block that does not contribute to the security of the system. So what's the ratio of these? And uh, we want it to be one. We want all the blocks to be on the main chain, uh, but when we get forks, we get fewer and fewer of this. Again, this is improving, uh, late, trying to improve uh, latency. And this is larger blocks, goes down quickly. Time to win. How long from the time you generate a block until the last competing block is generated? So until any other miner agrees that this is the longest chain and they stop generating comp uh, competing uh, branches. Maybe bad competitors, but any competing branches. Uh, this should be small. We don't want this to happen at all. We want it to be zero optimally. And we see that as we increase uh, block frequency, we get longer time to wait. As we increase block size, we need uh, longer time to wait until uh, uh, we win as the main chain. Uh, so in summary, I talked about uh, scaling uh, the blockchain. We gave clear metrics. This is a way to evaluate results. We did not, these experiments did not evaluate any of the suggestions that are cu currently running on, on forums and as BIPs. Uh, this is just the raw Bitcoin. We wanted to see uh, um, uh, clear, stark trends. Uh, we measure uh, the consensus delay, the fairness, the power utilization, the time to win and the time to prune. Uh, these are new metrics that uh, we introduce and we believe are a good way to evaluate uh, um, alternative protocols. And we introduce the blockchain uh, test bed. Uh, we are very happy uh, to run your code on it. We're looking for collaboration here. We want to run experiments. You just need a, a real working client and it can just work uh, on this node, uh, on this system. Uh, we want uh, to make it big, realistic and effective and test real, uh, uh, real options for, for Bitcoin and beyond. Speaking of beyond, uh, I would like to present you now uh, Bitcoin NG. Uh, Bitcoin NG is a different protocol, a little bit. It's a different and new generation of blockchains and uh, it solves everything that I presented so far. <laughs> and the key is as follows, this is tricky. Uh, so bear with me. We have two types of blocks. We have key blocks, uh, they carry no content. Uh, they're just used for leader election. And we have micro blocks. These carry only content and there is no contention because only the leader is allowed to generate micro blocks when it is his turn to be leader. So for the epoch until the next key block. Uh, so key blocks uh, have the proof of work, just the same as Bitcoin, and they have the previous uh, block, which is probably a micro block, just the same as Bitcoin. And they carry a public key K generated by the miner. Now every uh, micro block has the actual transactions that this leader wants to introduce. And these are signed with the private key of that leader. So only the leader can generate the private lo blocks. Now, the interval between uh, the, the key blocks is the same as, as Bitcoin or similar. You can have very long intervals here. Let's say, think 10 minutes. And the micro blocks come in very quickly with short intervals, think seconds. This can be shorter than the uh, network uh, param um, diameter. Now fees. Uh, each uh, key block uh, gives the usual subsidy with, watch with the, uh, whatever way you, you do it. And we need to talk about the fees from the transactions. And the fees are distributed as follows. You have 40% going back to the leader and 60% going forward to the next miner the next leader. And the reason is uh, essentially this, uh, uh, the next miner, the one that gets the 60, is motivated to place itself as late as possible in the chain. It is motivated to include transactions from the previous miner rather than uh, include the 
include them in uh, their own microblock since they get 60% rather than 40. Uh, and uh, the leader on the left, the one that gets the 40%, he's motivated to place transactions in uh, microblocks because then he get his, gets his 40%. Um, uh, why 40%? Because we have to make uh, some assumptions on the size of an attacker and we don't want an attacker to, to be motivated to try to mine multiple blocks and have, it becomes complicated, but we, we, can, we can't have this at 10% because then larger miners might be motivated not to place uh, uh, transactions in blocks. Yep. Um, you know what, I will go back to double spending later on. If you're interested, I want to present the results now. Uh, these are the same experiments we ran before. Now I'm also giving you the results of Bitcoin NG. So uh, we go from left to right. Uh, now uh, Bitcoin NG has 100 second key block intervals in average and 10 second uh, micro block intervals. These are the actual transactions. That's not an average. That's the deterministic uh, interval. Uh, and we see that as we increase block frequency, same bandwidth, increase block frequency, we get the consensus to lay down like in Bitcoin, but better. And, um, sorry, the, the consensus delay, yeah. And uh, the same goes if, as you increase block size. Fairness is where it becomes interesting. Uh, Bitcoin NG suffers from no fairness deterioration. Because the key blocks are so far apart, you don't get many more forks. Uh, and so the fairness remains about one. This is qualitatively better. Uh, as you increase block size, same. We got it steady at one. This is some noise, obviously, from the experiments, uh, but it stays at one. Mining power utilization stays perfect with some noise, but perfect. Perfect as you increase block size. Time to win, almost no, uh, no uh, large forks. Same here. It's all great. Uh, so, uh, I uh, talked about two things here. I talked about uh, the test bed. In order to evaluate current proposals on Bitcoin, uh, you need a clear, explicit, and strong metrics, and you need to run the actual code and uh, emulate the world around it and see what happens. Uh, we have our test bed, and we're very happy to collaborate and run more experiments on it uh, with different ideas. Uh, I presented uh, Bitcoin NG, uh, different uh, way of running a blockchain. Um, we're very glad to hear your concerns and your comments uh, on, this, on this protocol and talk about future uh, adoption in Bitcoin or elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's awesome. Bitcoin NG, it's A. Nice, nice. All right, we have a little bit of a switch up. Uh, uh, guys over at Stochastic are going to swap with Andrew Miller from Coinscope uh, and Shadow Bitcoin. So is Andrew here? Andrew is rocking up. And uh, after that, we're going to have a quick break. So how are you guys feeling so far? Come on, people. Come on. Come on. Over here. I'll give it up for Bitcoin. Over here. Sorry, over there. Over here has it. These guys are awesome. I love you over there. All right, Andrew, you rock on. Here we go. Great. Make full screen. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrew. I'm a grad student at the University of Maryland Cybersecurity Center. I'm also a member of the brand new initiative for cryptocurrencies and contracts at Cornell, and I'm an advisor to Zcoin. And I'm going to tell you today about a uh, a pair of tools, one's a simulator framework for Bitcoin network and the other is an all-in-one measurement station for the Bitcoin network. Okay, so let me start by talking about uh, my Bitcoin simulator framework. So there are a couple of approaches to simulating the Bitcoin network. The easiest one is to make some kind of customized model that just uh, is a simplified abstraction of what you care about. Things like this were made like the Simbit model to show off how selfish mining works. The problem with this approach, although it's quite easy and efficient, is that uh, what you put in is what you get. So if the model that you come up with differs from the actual behavior of the Bitcoin network, then you're not actually learning anything about the real Bitcoin network. So a better approach that kind of uh, resembles uh, not the following talk, but the previous talk, Itai's uh, system, is to have a local private network um, where you're actually running the real Bitcoin code. 
Um, but one problem with this is that you, you don't then have as full control over the network. Uh, so it's possible that if what you care about modeling are race conditions, then it may be hard to repeat those. And uh, second of all, you need to actually have a very powerful computing system because you need to run it basically in real time. So that's why you would need um, about as many cores as you want to have nodes. Um, so the approach that I'm going to talk about is an alternative that's a cross between simulation and emulation. It involves uh, running the real code, but it's going to run it on an entirely simulated network. So all of the network calls are substituted out for uh, a simulated network where we have total control over it. This effectively decouples uh, the virtual simulation time from the real world time. Okay, so the starting point for this is the shadow framework. This was made by Rob Jansen, who's now at Naval Research Lab. Um, this was his PhD thesis, and it's this framework uh, that works like that, and he mostly used it to study BitTorrent and Tor. Uh, and so for my uh, summer internship with uh, Rob, I upgraded the shadow framework so that could it, su it could support Bitcoin. The challenge in supporting Bitcoin is that uh, Shadow was really only made to handle at applications that have a very simple event loop, like just one single threaded uh, event loop with non-blocking I.O. And Bitcoin's architecture is actually really complicated. It has multi-threads, it has a combination of blocking and non-blocking I.O. So we had to sort of re-architecture Shadow to support it. Um, but we achieved that, it works. We have this code, Shadow Bitcoin, online. And what we're able to do is to run simulated networks with up to 6,000 nodes. Um, using only 64 cores. So as a result, this runs like 1 14th slower than real time, but that's okay because all of the times are simulated anyway, so the fidelity of the network is fine. Um, but we run into a problem, which is that we need to have some way of bootstrapping what's the structure of the network topology, and so that's actually a question. We don't know what that looks like. So that brings me to the next project, which is CoinScope. This, the goal of this is to measure the Bitcoin's uh, overlay network topology. So this is something that we actually run scans of the network roughly every four hours periodically. Um, I'll tell you in detail like what it is that we do. Um, our focus is network health, not de-anonymization. Um, we try not to be like chain analysis, so we just, uh, we, we have our UMD coin scope is like the flag we fly under. We never use more than one uh, outgoing connection to nodes. So we think of ourselves as an extended version of getadder. Okay, so you know, relative to the state of the art, everyone knows GetAdder is the, uh, the gold standard for Bitcoin measurement so far. This tells you all lots of details about nodes. You can see which reachable nodes are there on the network. Um, you can see where they're distributed around the globe, what versions they have, but what you don't learn about is how they're connected to each other. Okay, now we think that, ran that Bitcoin strives to have a random graph. It does this because every node makes eight outgoing connections and those are selected randomly and it can receive up to 117 incoming uh, connections in addition to that. And the nodes store and propagate to each other information about peers that they might be able to connect to. So in a nutshell, the thing that we do in CoinScope is periodically scrape the entire Adderman contents of every reachable node that we can connect to. Okay, now to understand what kind of data we can get from this, you have to understand what, uh, how the Adderman data structure is populated, how Bitcoin nodes propagate information about potential peers. So there's two ways that nodes share uh, data about the peers that they have. One is that uh, they will relay uh, addresses to each other. Um, this begins whenever a connection is formed, then the initiator of the connection sends its address, and then that node sends its ad that address to a couple more peers and so on. It sort of percolates through the network. Um, every node also announces itself every 24 hours for each connection that it has. Right? And the other way is that if a node sends a get adder message, which it does every time that uh, it forms a connection, then the peer receiving the get adder message sends 2,500 of its addresses uh, along that connection. Okay, now in the relay part, uh, you actually get the same timestamp. So when a connection's initiated, you get an address message that has the timestamp of that connection time. And as it percolates through the network, it has the same connection time. However, when you get a response from a get adder, you actually add two hour penalty to the timestamp before you store it in your Adderman data structure. All right, and that has this bizarre effect, which is that if you look at a node, uh, like one IP address, and you look at all of the timestamps with the adder messages that show up in all of the Addermans of all of the other nodes that might know about it, you see these weird clustering effects. You see like one cluster where there are a lot of timestamps corresponding to the moment when the connection was established, but you also see these sort of echoes with varying layers of two hour penalties applied. So you can sort of see like a, a signal that's there representing that initial connection event. Uh, and you can actually see that the uh, outgoing connection continues to be updated. So you, you have this like leading edge that represents a current connection. 
Okay, so if you collect all of this data, you can stack it all up. No, this is like all of the address messages about all of the nodes from all of the nodes. And like the size of the node corresponds to the uh, like number of address messages that the number of address records that have the same timestamp. Okay, and so you can see two like phenomena from this. One is that you can identify when was the most recent connection formed by a node. And the other is that you can see from this kind of frontier of uh, timestamps within 20 minutes new, those are actually active current connections. Okay, so once we do this, we can create these really cool looking snapshots of the network where we can draw every node as like a, a, a vertex here and then all of the edges represent actual established connections between these nodes and the size of the node represents its degree. So this is really only a subset of the graph. It's not that we get the whole graph this way because we're only looking at reachable nodes and the connections between reachable nodes to other reachable nodes. Uh, we don't learn anything about the mobile clients behind firewalls from this. Okay, and mostly we see roughly what we would expect, that it's nearly random. Um, nodes have fairly low degree, but we're able to find a bunch of cool super nodes. So this is a snapshot from almost a year ago, actually. And what we found was surprising is that a large number of the, the highest degree nodes were from the Bitcoin affiliate mining network, which has um, kind of geo-distributed. Basically, we found 40 different nodes that all have um, host names with Bitcoin affiliate mining in it and are listed on their website, and they each have 1,000 plus connections. So we can identify super nodes with this. Okay, so here's the caveat, though. Um, there's a patch in version 10.1 that breaks this. Um, I think that core developers knew that I've been doing this for um, a while and it hasn't been something that has like a clear de-anonymization problem against users, but um, a researcher, Jonas Nick, pointed out that, uh, he pointed out that this, this uh, property that allows us to do this and suggests that it could be used for de-anonymization so it would be better to patch it. Um, so this a technique no longer works and I can't make nice snapshot uh, figures like that, um, but arguably it's an improvement to uh, privacy. Um, that wouldn't stop an attacker anyway. There's an alternate technique called TX Pro, which uses a completely different mechanism. It actually uses the mempool and transaction data structure, and it's kind of more invasive, so we don't have any intention of doing that on the live network. Uh, it also requires you to spend bitcoins to pull it off. And another point is that the visible network might not matter so much anyway. Um, whatever we can see is only what uh, we see by looking at people running the ordinary nodes that follow this behavior. Any sort of private uh, peering agreements we wouldn't see any information about, and those might turn out to be really crucial to understanding what happens in the network with block, block propagation and so on. Okay, so the conclusion that I want to make is that I would like to see something like measurement being like a deliberate goal of Bitcoin design. Right, so attackers are going to use more invasive techniques than researchers are going to dare to. Um, there are some other precedents for this, like Tor has a nice usage uh, st statistics collection that is privacy preserving, but it allows them to collect information about the geolocation of nodes and users. Um, there's also a cool project, Statoshi, which collects like a whole lot of information and records it about the like status of your node and its data structures. Um, so it would be interesting to try to make privacy preserving versions of this that still allow us to get insight into how the network topology is going. Okay, and the only other comment that I want to make is that uh, along this, uh, anytime you do this research into how the Bitcoin network behavior operates, you see that there's tons of like vulnerabilities and opportunities for denial of service attacks. So I think that everyone agrees with this now um, that it, it would be a good idea to fortify the peer-to-peer -peer network. And the only point I want to make is that if we make a large change to the network to fortify it, then that'll have other impacts on you know, what we think about uh, block size and other scaling questions. Okay, so we should try to make those scaling questions relative to whatever is the improved network we're able to come up with. Okay, and then with just a final slide, I want to briefly plug this project. Uh, we are launching a academic journal for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency research called Ledger. Our main goal is to provide a really useful peer review service that's efficient and effective and is useful to society. Um, and we want to build a healthy bridge between academia and Bitcoin development communities. This is going to be open access with no totally stupid paywall policies. Those are gross. And we're going to do something a little unusual where we're going to publish the reviews alongside articles. I think every academic could, conference should do this, but you know, we're going to do this in this journal. And we're going to do a bunch of other features that are uh, you know, totally understandable to you, but for some reason other places don't do this, like we're going to timestamp and digitally sign the documents that we publish. And you'll hear more about this from Peter R. That's all. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Awesome. Okay. All right. So, uh, Connor, Nathan, you guys in the house? You come for the party? I guess. Going once, going twice. 
All right. Well, we haven't heard from them, um, but before we go on, we're going to go for break, but I just wanted to say uh, thank you uh, for awesome presentations on testing, simulation, and modeling before security and privacy. Um, I just want to say this is the best Bitcoin presentation conference I've been at, not blockchain, not consensus. It's a Bitcoin presentation, um, and it's been awesome. So we're going to go for a break. Um, give yourselves a hand. We just rocked through the first half, going through some more. And we're going to come back, um, and we're going to do, I think we're going to do Bram, right? Yeah. Where's Bram? Rockstar Bram. Bram, raise your hand. Does everybody know Bram? See that guy? Say hi to him during the break because he's going to rock a presentation after. Bram is awesome. Thank you, everybody. We'll be back. Ten-minute break. Ten minutes. Let's do it. <laughs>